Good morning, everyone. Thanks for your patience. I'm Cindy Arnson, the director of the Latin American program at the Wilson Center, and I'm delighted to be joined by my colleague and friend, Benjamin Gadan, the deputy director of the Latin American program for this crisis conversation with the president of Panama, Laurentino Cortizo. This is the fourth of our crisis conversations in a series um, of discussions with presidents who are on the front lines of responding to the COVID-19 pandemic um, that has taken such a terrible toll on the entire world, but especially on Latin America and the Caribbean. President Cortizo comes to the presidency with a rich background in the public and private sectors. He served for many years at the Organization of American States. This is, of course, after receiving a PhD from the University of Texas. Um, after his work at the OAS, he returned to Panama uh, to manage the family business and subsequently was elected to the Panamanian legislature and served two consecutive terms from 1994 to 2004, also becoming the president of the Legislative Assembly. President Cortizo, thank you so much for joining us. I now want to um, switch the conversation to Spanish. This is not something that had been announced in the invitation. And for that, I send, uh, I express my, my apologies um, to the audience. We do not have simultaneous translation. Um, the subsequent part of this conversation and the president's remarks will be in Spanish. So thank you for your indulgence. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Arson. L let me tell you something. Uh, I'm going to, to have this conversation in English. Uh, knowing what you just said, I prefer to practice my, my, my English. I have been uh, out of the US for about a year and a half with the pandemic. Usually I used to go once or twice, especially in the uh, full time, to one see a, a college football game. But in the last year and a half, I didn't have that opportunity, but uh, uh, I'm going to practice with uh, both of you, my English, I uh, please uh, accept uh, any bad pronunciation, but I hope to better with this conversation. And uh, in July, I'm going to be in Texas in an uh, investment mission, foreign investment mission in, in uh, Dallas, Houston, and uh, the best city in the uh, US, Austin. So I'm going to practice my English. Great, thank you so much, President Cortez. So we know that your English is excellent and <laughs> truly appreciate uh, your, uh, your, your efforts in this. And if you need to change to Spanish, we'll be, we'll be happy to hear that as well. Um, I'll like, I'd like to start with an initial question about um, the response of the government of Panama to the pandemic, um, both in terms of public health um, and in economic terms, um, the country has suffered one of the most pronounced economic declines in the entire region, um, something like 18% in 2020, assuming that this is because of the reduction in um, international commerce uh, through the canal. Um, could you give us an idea of how your country, how your administration has responded um, to the pandemic, what the actual situation of COVID is in Panama, whether you are suffering one of these terrible third waves, fourth waves, um, as many countries um, of, of the region have experienced. Um, and related to that, please give us an idea um, about the ability of Panama to access vaccines, either from private companies based in the United States or the UK, um, or through uh, governments such as Russia or China. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arson. First of all, yesterday was the uh, International Nurses Day worldwide. So I'm going to take this opportunity to, to send uh, 
huge thanks to the uh, nurses of the world, the nurses of the region, and my nurses. I was in the ceremony yesterday. It was a, it was a beautiful ceremony uh, because of uh, their courage, sacrifice, and discipline. So I'm taking this, this opportunity to say, you know, a thanks for, for everything that you have been doing for, for the people of the world and for my people here in Panama. In the, uh, the question that you uh, ask, uh, first of all, you, you, you are talking, I'm going to talk about the, the impact of the, uh, the COVID-19 in Panama. Since early January, 2020, we were following the China issue, the things that were going in Wuhan and how it passed the virus from China to other countries, to Japan, and I think that it was Thailand. And on January 20th, the US announced its first case. And then a couple of days after, uh, also Europe, it was I think France, Italy. So by January, we, we uh, and our health team was aware that we were going to confront a pandemic. That's when on February the 2nd of last year, it was a Sunday, Sunday Super Bowl, the Super Bowl of the uh, Kansas City Chief with the uh, San Francisco 49ers. That night, I installed our uh, task force, health task force, to uh, confront, no, it's not confront, to attend the, uh, the uh, pandemic, the virus. Matter of fact, I did have time to see the halftime show and the uh, uh, third and fourth quarter. But from there on, we were well aware of the magnitude of the uh, pandemic. In that day, that night, I told the teams, different ministries, different institutions, that we were going to follow a strategy. And that strategy was first, to listen to the people that know. In, the, in that matter, we had a, health team, public health team, but at, at the side, parallel, we have a, a, a council of experts. And I usually, not only now as president of Panama, but I utilize a strategy of a fighter pilot, Lieutenant John Boyd was a US fighter pilot. The strategy is observe, that's the first, you know, observe what's going on with the pandemic, analyze, give me recommendation, and at the end, as president of Panama, take the decision. And we have been doing that since the beginning of the pandemic. We don't want to improvise anything. Obviously, obviously in pandemic, you have to be fast, you know, velocity, 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 but, with caution, every decision that we take, we have to think it, think it over. It has to be observed, it has to be analyzed, and I need to have written the recommendation of the team. And that, that's the way that we have been dealing with the pandemic. The other thing is that uh, I study my undergraduate in a military university in the US, and for, my experience, when you could see an enemy, that's important, that's an advantage. But in my case, not being able to see the enemy was really tough and it has been really tough. So we decided that we have to do everything that we need to do to get as many tests. So the first alternative, the first option in the strategy was testing, testing, and testing. That was very important because by testing, we knew where the enemy 
was or is, and also in parallel, the tracing. So that positive person with whom has be, he been having relationship or been in touch with. So we have a very robust tracing, tracing team around the country. So that was, you know, the focus on uh, of of uh, of uh, dealing with the the pandemic. The other issue that was really tough here in in the uh, in my case in Panama is that the beginning. Well, let's 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 re let's remember that I began my administration. My oath was in July first of nineteen nineteen. So we are talking about that seven months after my installation, my administration, we confronted a pandemic. Let's forget about the fiscal issues. Let's forget about the uh, debt, that it was big, uh, accounts payable for Panama, more than 2,800 million in, in debt, in uh, accounts payable. But the, the, the other thing is that when we ask, I ask how many intensive care units do we have ready for COVID patients? The answer was 175. That was a chuck. So the effort was, okay, let's utilize uh, hotels as hospitals, and we have many hotels as a hospital. That was a, a very good move. It was a very good decision. It was a very good recommendation and decision. And also expand uh, uh, new hospitals for for uh, salas, cama de sala beds, and also we increase from 175 available uh, intensive care units, we have now around 1,000. But at this moment, we are only using around 50, five zero, five zero. On testing right now in Panama, out of 100 tests, for example, yesterday, only five were positive. However, at the beginning of the year, last middle of December, at the beginning of the year, the percentage of positive for, let's say, of 100 was close to 30. That's very high. And that was not, that was not again, a, the, the, the moment that I have to take a very tough decision, lockdown. Lockdown is terrible. It is terrible for everything, for everybody. In my house, it's terrible. In my house. Uh, so when, when I took that decision, it was for the second time, Obviously, with 175 intensive care units, the lockdown in Panama was tough. I have no other road. And that was the decision. It was not tough. That's why now we do have a, a health system that only is using 50 intensive care units. It's because we do have a team. It is a very good team. And when I say team, that's a word that I use every day, maybe 10, 20, 50 times. And it has to be a team aligned. What I mean aligned is aligned and discipline. That's very important, discipline. If you get here, this is my working office. 
I am speaking to you in my working office. We have a fancier one in front, but I like this one. In front of my office, there is a sign that says the only easy day was yesterday. That's a Navy SEAL motto. That's the sign. The only easy day was yesterday. We have been dealing with this uh, pandemic, this invisible enemy for 14 months. And every time that I go out of this office to visit people, because I like to do that, to be in touch with people, I tell them we are not won anything yet, but we are going to win it. And the only way to win it is unity. And that's what I ask my people. Let's unite political issues, election, the time will come. But now we have to unite. I'll go now back to the other question, talking about uh, the decline in economic uh, aspects here in Panama. Indeed, because of the uh, strong lockdown, the economic growth declined around 18%. That's high. However, the Canal of Panama, the Panama Canal, and the ports, the best ports in the region, as you know, Panama, the location of Panama, Panama has the best connectivity by air, maritime, in Latin America, and the Caribbean. And that helped us. The Panama Canal never stopped in pandemic. And also our ports on the Atlantic side and on the Pacific side, they never stopped. We were open to the world. And as you know, around five to 6% of the uh, world goods go through the canal. So that's, that was a, uh, also a big challenge for Panama and the Panamanians to serve the world. However, talking about economics, the perspective for Panama on the economic side, and I'm going to utilize data and number from the IMF and the World Bank. For Latin America, the economic growth projected for 2021 is around 4%. For Panama, it's around 12%. This is IMF World Bank. And for 2022, they are talking about for the region, World Bank, well, IMF 3% for the region, Panama 5%. And World Bank 4.4 for the region in 2022 and for Panama 10%, 9.9. So the outlook, economic outlook of Panama is bright. And it's really bright. Uh, we, and, and I feel uh, really positive. The month of uh, February, March, April, has been good month for Panama. And besides that, as you know, we do have here in Panama around 175 multinational headquarters, including, for example, Procter & Gamble, Dell, 3M, ICE, big multinationals that are established here in Panama because Panama has not only is a dollarized economy, but it has a, an instability, political stability, economic stability. The, the rule of law is very important for us, for my administration. And I would like to talk about that later on because 
out of nine uh, magistrado, magister of the Supreme Court, I have to nominate six. I already uh, nominated three. So I have to nominate three more. That's a big uh, responsibility because the heart of a democracy lies on a good justice system. Um, we have been very careful here in Panama. I say there is a, like a triangle. How to deal with the health, health issues, with the social issues, and with the economic issues. That balance is very important, especially in the condition that we have been living in the world, in the region. Maybe you have a good economic measurement, but you have to weigh that with the social issues and with the health issues. The decision that a leader or president or prime minister has to take now with the pandemic has to be very careful. It could be, I'll repeat again, a very good economic measurement, but that could cost social trouble. So we have to be very careful. And the third question that you ask, Dr. Arson, is about vaccines. Panama has around 4.4 million people. So it's a small country. Panama is a, it's a beautiful country. And I'm not saying that because I'm the president of Panama. Well, I have to say it because I'm the president of Panama. But uh, the people of Panama uh, are good people and the country is beautiful. I mean, really, really beautiful. In the issue of the uh, vac vaccinate, vaccination, on uh, the 27th of July of last year, I had my first meeting with the team that was in charge of, of the mission of acquire the best possible vaccine. Secure and effective. As of now, we have 9,100,100 vaccines. 9,100,100 vaccines. Out of those 9 million, 7 million 100 are Pfizer and the rest AstraZeneca. Those are the only two vaccines that we are utilizing here in Panama. We have been executing a dynamic strategy on our vaccination program that has been very good. The organization, again, teamwork and the logistics has been very good. It is a teamwork and I'm a member of that team and I'm proud of my team. But uh, I feel uh, good as a president that we act with enough time to guarantee my people enough vac vaccine to even vaccinate people, kids from, I think that it has been approved by FDA from 12 years up. So I'm, 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 we are ready. Excellent, thank you so much. And I wanna thank you again for joining us, President Cortizo. You and Cindy have mentioned the economic impacts that this pandemic have had in Panama. You know, the economic contraction of 18% was the most severe in Latin America. And as we all know, Latin America was the region of the world that suffered the most severe impacts 
from this virus. Now, the pandemic is obviously far from over in Latin America and Panama as well, but I would like you to speak briefly about your vision for post-pandemic economic recovery, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll have this exchange quickly so we can move on to other subjects in our remaining time. Now, oh, right. you know, the, just, just quickly, the, the context obviously is favorable for Panama. You know, you've seen a recovery in global trade. Um, Panama is a very open economy and, and China's recovery, significant economic stimulus in the United States have all been quite helpful to Panama. But I'm also interested in your particular strategies. You've directed enormous amounts of, of resources to infrastructure, for example. I think it's an $8 billion program that you've put forward, an airport expansion, a new light rail in Panama City, but you also face significant debt and a deficit, which you referenced earlier. And so I imagine there are limits to public spending for reactivating the economy. My question for you, and again, if, if we could address it briefly, is how else do you plan to reactivate the Panamanian economy, whether it's through investments in the digital economy, regulatory reform? What are the areas that would be less of a burden on the budget, but could still get Panamanians back to work? Okay, thank you very much on the, our, our economic recovery plan is based, well, it says we have a document. It's, this is our action plan right here. We have uh, 125 uh, actions that we need to execute, most of them. We, we, but we do have an, uh, an economic recovery plan that has five pillars. We cannot talk about recovery, economic recovery if we do not have a good vaccine strategy. That's the base of that triangle. You could have a lot of, a lot of plans, a lot of programs, but if you don't have, that's the main uh, policy that every country, not only I mean, in the world, but in the case of Panama, the base of that recovery plan is vaccination. If you do not have a good vaccination program, you could have everything else and it will crumble. So that's the, the basic, the base of that. We do have program for, for the uh, micro, small, medium uh, 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 enterprises. We have uh, infrastructure projects, uh, that generates quite a, a lot of uh, employment. We have also section four of that uh, economic recovery plan, uh, some resources for our financial sector and the bigger uh, economic activities, for example, construction. And the last one, the, the number five area, is uh, related to the attraction of foreign direct investment. In that issue, we do have uh, uh, new laws. For example, we have laws related to the uh, manufacturing uh, industry uh, that uh, will allow it to establish in Panama and take advantage of our uh, geographical position, our connectivity. We have some sectors that are very important for us. Of, of, of course, the, uh, the sector, the services sector is, is very important, but also the uh, logistic hub, very important, and uh, the digital uh, hub. We have been working very hard, matter of fact, uh, a MasterCard just uh, signed a memorandum of, of uh, entendimiento, understanding, MOU. And we are having very soon, as soon as the end of this month, a huge announcement of uh, an investment uh, related to the uh, energy sector. It's going to be a, a very good announcement for Panama. Can you so give us I, a hint? Uh, no. Okay. But it's, it's, it's going to be by the end of this month, by the end of the, of the uh, May, it's a uh, You don't have to worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
I'd like to. Uh, <laughs> I had to try. <laughs> I, I, I'd like to switch to another topic, which obviously is of uh, great concern globally, certainly um, to the United States and also to Panama, which is um, climate change. Um, Panama geographically, as you just mentioned, um, is in a unique position. It's also in a very vulnerable position. And almost counterintuitively, uh, the, the, the canal seems to be less threatened right now by sea level rise than by drought, which has, uh, and the lack of rain, which has affected water levels. Um, higher temperatures obviously ca cause higher rates of evaporation. Um, Panama is also a country that's enormously rich in biodiversity, something like 12% of your national territory uh, is protected. About 65% of your land um, is rainforest. So I was wondering um, if you could comment on the risks to Panama specifically and to the canal um, of climate change, and also the, um, the need to make incomes in rural areas um, sustainable. Panama is less urban than many other countries in Latin America. Something like 30% of the population um, lives in the countryside and rates of deforestation are intimately linked um, to poverty and, and lack of opportunity. So I wonder if you could address those um, climate and, and environmental concerns. Lisa, uh, that's a very good, good question. It's, it's related to sustainability. Um, and then you mentioned uh, the Panama Canal, but, uh, but it's not only the Panama Canal, it's also, well, it's the Panama Canal, but our towns and island that uh, the rays of the sea is also affecting Panama and the world. But we're talking about Panama. But uh, it, it, it worries us because we have been seeing every year, you know, the, the, the impact of the drought on, on the Panama Canal. Right now, the level of the Panama Canal is, is, is very good. But about uh, a year ago, it was not that good. And also the impact on, for example, food production. We see or a lot of or niña or niño affecting our economy, affecting our, our people. And we have to be very careful. And, 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 and we talked a lot about that, that we have to think much more or not only about our generation, but what effect our action will have in future generation that they will also need to have uh, an environment that we have to protect. In the case of Panama, we do have in our country, because this is an issue of global issues, it's not only Panama, we are a tiny, but we have been doing our part. About 60, 60, 65% our land is rainforest. And uh, by law, they, they are protected. And we are very, very, uh, I will compromise to keep them protected, to not allow no one to get inside uh, and to begin cutting trees to protect our fauna, our flora, is very important. It does really worry us. Not only we, I, we think that we have we are doing our our part, but I have to re, be very frank with you. I think that there are other big countries that they are talking a lot, but they are they are doing very little. And I hope that with uh, President Biden and uh, his leadership, we could have uh, a world that acts and talk less. 
because that's a that's a climate change is a is a real huge issue. President Cortizo, I want to test you one quick related question to climate change, and that's about migration. I mean, as you're well aware, climate change has been a big factor in driving migration north from the so-called Northern Triangle of Central America, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, but also it increases migration you know, elsewhere in the region and that has, of course, affected Panama. We've seen a dramatic increase, for example, in the number of migrants traveling from Colombia through the Darien Gap. Over the past four years, 46,000 migrants have crossed that jungle, including an alarming number of children who make this journey despite risks from snakes, organized crime, dehydration. My question is whether Panama has the resources it needs to address the needs of these migrants when they arrive. Are you getting the support you should be getting from Colombia, where many of these migrants originate, and from the United States, where many of these migrants are headed? Well, I have to be uh, very frank with you guys. I recently talked to President Duque. Recently, well, about um, two and a half weeks ago about the issue of migration. And we did, um, through our uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Erika Moines, that I think that uh, uh, the, uh, the center talked to her. Right. She, she's a very good uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs. We do have an agreement of uh, control flow, movement of migrants from Colombia to Panama. Obviously, in the last two weeks, that flow, that movement has diminished because of the Colombia issue. But before that, we were having a, an increased movement of migrants. Right now, we have around 2,500 2, migrants which is not, it's not too bad. You ask me about resources. My response, my answer is, of course we do need resources to attend uh, those people. You know, the housing, food, health, uh, it's, it takes money. And we have been uh, using our resources, our budget, to comply with the human rights that they that we should guarantee them, and we are doing it. With the US, with the, uh, the government, we also are having a, we have been having a very good relationship, not only on migrant, but on, on a lot of other things. The, the, the relationship with the US uh, is, a, is a very good relationship. Uh, is a uh, is, is strategic relationship, obviously, and operational. We have been doing with Colombia and the US, uh, not only dealing with the migration issue, but also other issues. For example, money laundering, organized crime. Uh, as of now, on the first four months of this year, till April, we have captured over 14 tons more of drugs than last year. And last year was an, a, an historic year. So we have been doing a, a very good operational work between Colombia, the US, also Costa Rica and Panama. Hey, thank you, President Cortizo. You've described um, the collaboration with the United States. Um, obviously, it's our hope that the Biden administration will look more broadly at Central America, not just at the Northern Triangle and uh, take into account the needs um, of other countries in that subregion and in, indeed in the entire hemisphere. Um, in the time remaining, I, I, I'm 
I'm not sure we have time for more than one more question, but um, I do want to ask about Panama's relationship with China. Um, it's not that long ago that Panama switched its um, diplomatic relations from Taiwan to the PRC. And I was wondering if you could talk about uh, the kind of relationship, the content of the relationship between P Panama and China and how that affects, if at all, your relationship with the United States. Well, first of all, remember, uh, well, it, it was the uh, last administration that indeed switched from uh, Taiwan to China. Uh, our relationship with the US is a strategic and, and it's a historic relationship. With China, it's a good relationship. But since I got into, into government, my administration has been very clear, not only with China, with, with, but with every other country, that our relationship, to be a good relationship, has to be based in one word, respect. And that word, I have said it to basically most of the uh, representative ambassadors of most of the countries. Panama will ask respect. And the respect is both ways, not one way. It's a two-way street. And uh, if you have a contract with Panama to, to do, to build an infrastructure, you have to comply with each clause, one. Second, the relationship with the government of Panama is a straightforward relationship. I, I always mention good investment, not only investment, not only foreign direct investment, but good foreign direct investment. That means we do not want anything under the table. As clear as that, that's the relationship that we want in Panama. My government is uh, Puertas Abiertas, Open Doors. I am an available president. Uh, yesterday in the morning at this time, I was with my jeans and with uh, people of the, uh, the countryside, listening to them, talking to them. And I don't like to use the word given because they already own that, that the, uh, it's a product of taxes. Eh, entregando, ¿cómo se dice entregando? Mm -hmm. Giving, mm -hmm. delivering laptops, tablets, scholarships to the US, to Canada, Cuba to study eh, medicine, helping people to have a better life. So, what you see here in President Cortizo Cohen is what it is. In the US, there are two words that I cannot use here because uh, I'm very respectful, but uh, I like to be frank. Frank with you, frank with the different government. I have been meeting, I had meetings and breakfast with uh, President Trump. I have uh, meetings with the uh, National Security Advisor here in Panama. I make conversations are always strong. I mean, uh, sincere, frank. That's, that's the best type of conversation. You have in Panama a friend. Uh, I love my country. And I want the best for my country. Uh, the relationship with the US is a special relationship. My wife, I met my wife when I was in Washington, DC. I was working for the OAS and she was studying at the, uh, what, uh, the uh, University of uh, George Washington University. 
she was studying for a master. She graduated from the master and she got a mister with a East Panamanian, in that time, Panamanian kid. My two kids, obvious from Puerto Rico, also they do have the US passport. So they are Pan Rican. And uh, I am honored to have this, this opportunity to talk because this is in, in, in effect, this is a conversation with uh, the Wilson Center. It is an honor for me to, to be here with you. President Cortizo, I see we just have a, a few more minutes. I had one more question, if you'd okay. permit it. The, we discussed China, which you know is often seen as an economic opportunity for Latin America. There seems to be an opportunity, however, from companies that are leaving China, and that's nearshoring. There's been a lot of discussion of supply chain disruptions during the pandemic and a desire in the United States to have some of those companies either come back to the United States or manufacture closer to home. My question is how you're positioning Panama to take advantage of that trend. Obviously, you're already a logistics hub. You were a pioneer in, in free trade zones. It seems like everything is aligned for Panama to be a real beneficiary of so-called nearshoring. You know, how optimistic are you and what is Panama doing affirmatively to make sure some of those businesses end up in Panama? Very good question. And I'm very optimistic here in Panama. Remember, from the beginning, I said, Panama is the country with the best connectivity by air and by sea in Latin America and the Caribbean. Our airport is the best, has the most international flight of the region. And we have the two best ports I mean, three best ports here in Panama. So the nearshoring is very important. And when I talked about, and this is the, uh, talk about five pillars of our recovery plan. One of them is attracting direct foreign investment. Considering the connectivity, the position of Panama. And that's why we, Passed and I sanctioned a couple of months ago that law of wealth manufacturing to give those companies that they want to be very close to their clients, Latin America and the Caribbean, benefits benefit to install here in Panama, Colon Free Zone or Panama Pacifico. And we are seeing now companies, multinational interested, and we, I have been receiving them. Matter of fact, I, I told you at the beginning, I'm, I'm going on July to Texas, but it's a business trip. I'm going to be meeting with a businessman from Dallas, Houston, and Austin. And most of them are thinking on this, the near shoring, the advantages that Panama has, and not only US, also Asian companies are also uh, coming to Panama to see all the benefits that they have in Panama. Uh, the near shoring is, is for Panama, obviously is very important. It's very important and the common sense tells you, hey, if you wanna invest, if you're a foreign company, if you wanna invest, what country in Latin America should you invest? Not only because of the people or the facility that have, you have here in Panama, but the connectivity, that country is Panama. President Cortizo, you've been extraordinarily generous with your time. We thank you very much for addressing us in English. Your English is excellent. I can't imagine why you would have uh, been uh, concerned about being able to speak in English. Um, thank you very much. Thank you to our audience who has joined us. The video of this event will be on our website. Um, and we look forward to staying in touch with you and your staff. Thanks as well to your excellent staff uh, at the embassy here in Washington. Um, we very much appreciate your joining us. Thank you, Dr. Arson, and thank you, Dr. Geden. Thank you very much. It's an honor. Wonderful. For us as well.